Hi, and welcome to Leslie's lab. In this episode, we're going to take a look at a nitrogen laser I recently acquired off eBay for just 28 pounds. This laser is actually capable of generating pulses of 36 kilowatts, although the pulse is very, very short, only four nanoseconds, and the deposit in energy is somewhere in the region of 150 microjoules. So the average power is very, very low, about three milliwatts. But we can use it to do interesting things like pump other lasers, such as dye lasers. In this episode, we'll start by tearing this thing down there, there isn't very much to see inside, everything's potted and in little metal cans, but we'll take a look anyway and I'll maybe explain what's going on with this thing. Um, after that we'll power it up uh, and observe the output pulses and then we'll pump a small dye laser with it as well. Now that we've got this on the bench we can uh, unscrew all the screws. Okay, that's all the screws out. We'll remove the laser from its case. And set that aside. So this is the inside of the laser. As I've said, it's not very exciting. We've got the main plasma cartridge here, which contains the laser tube itself, the capacitors and the spark gap. And we'll take a look uh, later on at what this looks like on the inside. We can't really undo all the screws on this because it's actually potted inside. It's all full of silicone but there's one that I have that I've stripped down some time ago that we can take a look at. We've got one PCB that we can see, which is responsible for distributing power and dealing with the input pulses. There's an opto isolator on the board here. When we receive a trigger signal in, uh, that fires the, the trigger module and fires the spark gap. If we turn it around on the other side, we've got the high voltage module itself. Again, it's potted in a nice little box that we can't really get at. Um, and we've another unit here, which contains the trigger transformer that triggers the spark gap and again all full of silicone so we can see we've got two main connections to the tube itself we've got the trigger voltage in and then we've got high voltage connecting down at the bottom in terms of voltage uh, the voltage that we actually charge the tube with in here is around about 17 and a half thousand volts but it's at a very low current so i don't think that you would stand uh, very much chance of electrocuting yourself with it i mean that said accidents happen if we take a look at the front of the tube, I don't know how well this will work. I'll try and focus the camera on it. This is the output window of the tube and you may or may not be able to see, I can check in post. There's two electrodes. This is actually transversely excited. So we've got two essentially aluminium rails that run the length of the tube where the discharge takes place through the nitrogen gas. An interesting point about these tubes is they're not, uh, they're not pure nitrogen inside. Uh, it's actually a mixture of nitrogen and helium in these, in these commercial tubes. Helium is just generally used as a buffer gas so that you can operate these things at higher pressures. At the rear of the tube, we might be able to see there's a sort of uh, quartz window, but the, the window itself is coated as a, as a high reflector. And at the front, again, we, we've got a quartz output window in this case there's a possibility that these are slightly reflective, so maybe 6% reflective at ultraviolet. This is a previously torn down plasma cartridge out of one of these lasers. As we can see, there's a number of high voltage capacitors and a spark gap in the middle. If we turn it around, we can see it from the, from the other side. The laser tube itself is very, very short. It's an alumina tube, I believe, the alumina, the ceramic, not the metal. Again, we can see the rear window is sort of ground, ground quartz, and then the front window itself. In fact, we can even see right down the tube there. Let me get the focus. So yes, if we focus on the end of the laser, we can see the two aluminium rails running down the length of the tube. So I spent a bit of time reverse engineering the laser plasma cartridge. Uh, this is the diagram. Uh, it looks quite simple on the face of it, but how it works is, is kind of technical. Um, we've got two capacitors in my diagram here. We've got CD and CPK. CD corresponds to these two large dumper capacitors, uh, either side of the spark gap there. CPK um, corresponds to the peaker capacitors, uh, which are wired across the laser tube. With nitrogen lasers, you need an exceedingly short discharge, and this is what this circuit's all about. So when we charge the circuit, we put high voltage in here, 17,500 volts. 
CD, the dumper, um, charges up via this resistor up here and that resistor down there and it charges up to the charging voltage. When the spark gap fires, you know, we're, we apply a, a little high voltage pulse to this spark gap, the contents of this capacitor um, trans transit the spark gap, charge up the peaking capacitor very, very quickly. So the spark gap conducts in, I don't know, five, 10 nanoseconds, something like that. A relatively long period in, 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 uh, in the scheme of things. And the job of the peaking capacitor is to take that relatively slow pulse and peak it um, to a point where uh, we can get a very, very fast discharge across the laser tube. So once the peaking capacitor reaches its peak voltage, um, the laser tube conducts uh, and the discharge that forms between the two electrodes in the laser tube is hopefully short enough um, to populate the upper laser level and, and to start lasing. I'll move this out of the way. Uh, there's another variant um, of this charge transfer circuit as it's known. Uh, down here we would have CD and CTK. Um, this is perhaps a more easy to understand the variant of this circuit. We've got the dumping capacitor, the peaking capacitor, and we can see that when the switch SG closes, we essentially charge up this peaking capacitor very, very quickly. Uh, it's worth noting as well that the peaking capacitor is about half the capacitance of the dumper. Uh, and the idea behind that is we reach the peak voltage uh, of the peaking capacitor very, very quickly again. Um, you'll notice there's a resistor wired across um, the laser tube here. Um, as, as far as the, uh, the discharge is concerned with the peaking capacitor, the resistor appears to be open circuit. Um, so it preferentially discharges through the laser tube uh, rather than um, discharging through the resistor. The purpose of the resistor is to discharge our peaking capacitor uh, between fires. The third version um, of nitrogen laser circuits you may come across and you might be more familiar with, especially if you've read Light and Its Uses, um, is the LC inversion circuit, uh, sometimes referred to as the Bloom line in the literature, uh, although whether or not it's a transmission line seems to be a little bit of an internet argument these days. Uh, basically, we have two equal capacitances um, either side of the laser channel, and both of them are charged up um, simultaneously uh, via the charging resistor. We'll just put an R in there. Um, so when we apply high voltage, um, this would charge up to say 17,000 volts, this would charge up to 17,000 volts, but when we close the gap, we essentially short circuit one side of this diagram, um, which means we, we've got a, almost a dead short to ground, which provides a potential difference across the laser tube, um, again firing the laser. Now we have the laser reassembled. Uh, we can power it up. But before I do, I want to talk about a couple of things. So at the back, there's a BNC connector that accepts a TTL signal. Pulse width has to be a millisecond, um, but it's TTL, so it's all good. So we can power this from an arbitrary function generator. Uh, it, the frequency of pulses you can provide run anywhere from one to 20 hertz. So when we start this thing up, we'll just start it up at five hertz. The power requirements, as I've said, is only 24 volts. So it's a couple of amps or so, you know, maybe one and a half amps, something like that. It's, the original DC adapter on the back of that was some kind of uh, fancy carry-on with three pins in it. So when I bought this, um, I promptly removed that and replaced it with a standard 2.1 millimeter barrel jack. We can see on the oscilloscope here that we're already putting pulses out uh, to the back of the laser unit, and we can see that they're one millisecond wide. So we'll apply power to this and we should be able to see some output. So the laser's firing. There's not very much to see at the moment. Um, the beam itself is ultraviolet, so it's invisible. However, if we put a piece of ordinary paper in front of it, we'll be able to see the fluorescence from the paper. Uh, paper generally looks quite yellow. Um, and as part of the manufacturing process, they put dye in the paper, uh, probably one of the Kamarin dyes, which when it uh, receives ultraviolet light, it actually re-emits um, visible blue light photons and sort of changes the color balance of the paper. So if we hold a piece of paper in the beam path, um, you'll be able to see that flashing. The beam itself is unlike that that you would see from any other kind of laser. It's kind of um, a rectangular bar uh, that's emitted kind of similar to diode lasers without the lens, I guess. Um, it's interesting, some of the pulses aren't caught on the camera and weird artifacts might appear because of the rolling shutter of the camera, but we can see it nonetheless. Uh, the beam diverges quite, uh, quite a lot, so you know across the room the, the width of this 
uh, rectangular blob uh, might be about two inches across or so. It's interesting to note that when the nitrogen laser is running, if we take a look at the signal on the oscilloscope, um, as I pointed out before, we can already see our one millisecond uh, TTL signal that we're providing to the scope. But because the, the cable is essentially running inside the case and isn't actually shielded in there, we can actually see the spark gap. So if we turn up the time base a wee bit, there it is. Uh, so now we're at 500 nanoseconds per division. We can see the rising edge of our initial pulse, and then we can see the spark gap fire. You can tell it's a spark gap because of the ringing that takes place. Interesting property of ultraviolet light is it tends not to travel very well through glass. Um, so I'll just mount a glass lens with a bit of blue tack onto the end of a biral, and we'll see if we can observe that slot again. And I'll move the lens into the beam, and you can see it totally obscures the beam. Uh, this is ordinary uh, solder glass, I imagine. Um, however, some lenses will work, and uh, lenses made out of pure quartz, for example, will transmit ultraviolet. So again, if I stick one on the end of my biro here, we'll see that now we can focus this down to quite a small point. And it's worth remembering that the peak power in this is very, very high. It won't be enough to burn paper or anything like that, but you know, you're talking 36 kilowatts focused into a very, very tiny spot. One of the main uses for nitrogen lasers is pumping dye lasers. And if I take a, a small cuvette uh, filled with a dye solution and hold it in front of the laser, we'll see the dye fluorescing. Um, in this case, I've got rhodamine 6G inside of this cuvette, so it's flashing uh, bright orange. I'll just set that one aside. And if I go and retrieve another cuvette, this one has a Kumarin dye in it, similar to the one that we saw in the, in the paper there. And this will fluoresce blue, although not quite as brightly. I've set up a small experiment here where um, I've put a, a homemade optical detector in the light path of the nitrogen laser. If I hold up a bit of paper over the front of the detector, we should be able to see the flashes of blue that are coming off it. Um, the photo detector is a, is a very, very... Uh, high speed, it's got a rise time of about a nanosecond. Um, you can get these for, from uh, various places, including Thor Labs. Uh, they're quite expensive. They're about £36 just for the bare photodiode. Um, so after, bu after buying the diode, it's a case of uh, putting together a very, very simple circuit um, to read off uh, the, the, the pulses of light that it detects. If we take a look at the light output on the oscilloscope, we can see that at this, at this repetition rate, 11 hertz, um, the pulse-to-pulse -pulse, um, energies vary quite significantly. Uh, we can actually see, though, that the full width half maximum is around about 4 nanoseconds, um, as it says in the data sheet. One of the uses of nitrogen lasers is to pump dye laser. Uh, here's a dye laser that I built myself. It just comprises of a couple of mirror mounts. These are Newport 1-inch uh, mirror mounts. I wanted to make this thing as small as I possibly could. I have a, a quartz cylinder lens. Uh, on one side that's mounted on a, a small optical rail that we can uh, screw in and out to focus it on the on the cuvette itself. And if I turn it around, we can see the, the cuvette in the back there. It's actually leaning to one side. This is deliberate. It's not because I'm cack-handed when I build things. Um, it's to stop uh, reflections off of the side of the cuvette bouncing back and forth between the mirrors and, and spoiling the, the beam quality, such as it is. If we rotate the dye laser a little bit more, we can see the high reflector at the back. This is just a standard uh, aluminium coated mirror. And the reflector at the front is just a 50-50 beam splitter. On the front of the laser assembly, I've actually mounted uh, a lens. This is just a, it's a CCTV lens housing that I've drilled out uh, and put my own lens in there to collimate the beam. The beam, when it comes out of this thing, is really quite uh, divergent. So in, in just you know, 30 centimeters or so, you get quite a large spot out of the thing, and I wanted to uh, narrow that down somewhat. The construction's dirt simple. I mean, it, it's just basically a piece of aluminium plate uh, that I've cut a square out of. I've mounted a piece of um, 12 millimeter uh, square section tube to hold the cuvette, so I can take the cuvette out and replace it with another one quite easily. 
just come over here and grab the Rhodamine Cuvette. And it sits at just the right angle for the dye laser. The mirrors are mounted at, uh, are, are set at odd angles at the end because we've had to lean the curvette over. We have to um, tilt the mirrors as, as, the, as the light bends as it comes out of the curvette. So it's quite fun to align this thing. So that's it. I mean, it's very, very tiny. I mean, you can hold the thing in the palm of your hand. Um, very, very small laser. So I suppose the thing to do now uh, would be to get the nitrogen laser to drive this dye laser. So before we do, a little explanation of what's happening here. When the, when the nitrogen laser light comes in through the cylinder lens, we're actually going to focus the light into a very, very thin line um, on the dye itself. And the length of that line essentially becomes the, the part of the laser cavity, which is pretty cool. Um, I suppose the best thing to do at this stage will be to set it all up, fire it up, and we'll take a look at it. The dye laser is set up now. And we can see, or should be able to see on the camera, the very, very thin line that's been focused onto the side of the dye cell. I've used Rhodamine 6G for this one. It's just much easier to see. Uh, the Kumarin dye is a little dim. Now we're looking at paper once again. Uh, it's at this time we've got uh, an orange spot projected by the dye laser onto the surface of the paper. If we turn up the repetition rate, We might be able to see it a bit better. Uh, that's at 11 hertz now. It's worth noting that, um, as I've said previously, this beam is actually collimated. If we go over here and take off the collimation lens, we can see the raw beam as it emerges from the dye laser itself before it's collimated. have to unscrew this it's uh, we want to do it without disturbing anything yeah so the beam as we can see uh, perhaps see on the camera is really quite ugly let's see if I can put it in shadow Maybe do it adjusted a wee bit. I think that's about the best beam quality we'd expect to get out of this. Uh, the beam itself is actually, a, and if you actually look at it under, you know, some some detail, it's actually a magnified image of the side of the cavette wall, um, where the where the glass meets or quartz glass meets. We'll just screw that back in. Now, if we want to change the color of the dye laser. We can simply remove the cuvette, put in a cuvette with a different dye in, and now we get a blue-violet beam from the Kamarin 1. We can see the side of the Kamarin 1 dye being, uh, being hit with the nitrogen laser. In, in terms of actual output power here, if, if we're putting 36 kilowatts into the dye laser, dye lasers are approximately 30% uh, efficient, so you'd be looking at maybe um, 10 kilowatts out, perhaps. Um, in terms of actual energy, you'd probably be looking at 50 microjoules, which is piffling. Um, and in terms of, uh, of average power, uh, you're looking at well under a milliwatt, um, I would say, out of this. I mean, it has to be said, this nitrogen laser is probably quite old as well. I think it was 20 years old when I found the date code in there. Um, so, so it's probably well past its um, serviceable life, really, and the output power is probably somewhat diminished as well. Um, it is possible to build nitrogen lasers yourself at home. Uh, and in fact, over the years, I've built several. Just recently, I've built some very, very high power, very, very high repetition rate nitrogen lasers that totally blow this thing out of the water uh, in terms of performance. And perhaps in a couple of weeks, uh, I'll tidy up the lab a wee bit. Um, I'll do a video on those as well. Uh, they do require nitrogen, although they will run off plain old air. Um, you know, we can actually we can actually get ordinary air to actually laze uh, and behave as a laser enough enough so to pump dyes as well, uh, which is excellent. Um, the dye lasers, the nitrogen lasers I've built, 
and are so powerful that you don't even need mirrors in the dye laser. You can literally stand the curvette in front of the in front of the beam itself, and it will just laze. You don't need any mirrors or anything. Laser beams just appear out of each side of the curvette, which is kind of cool. So I hope you enjoyed this episode of Les's Lab. If you want to see more adventures with nitrogen lasers and dye lasers, don't forget to hit like and subscribe. Um, I'll link in the data sheet for the LSI nitrogen laser down below in case you're lucky like me and happen to score one of these things off eBay. Um, I'll also link in the PDF for the Lambda Chrome dyes um, so that you can see all of the various types of dyes that you can use in dye lasers. Um, thanks for watching and see you in the next episode.